I'm Rachel Seidman Kurtz. I'm one of the librarians here at the library, and uh, I want to welcome you to our Great Presenter Series. Um, for those of you who might not know what our Great Presenter Series is, Matt, can you hear me through this? Can you all hear me through the speaker? Okay. Um, thank you to Wakeham for recording tonight's um, presentation. It will be available online uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, so our Great Presenter Series happens the first Tuesday of every month, and we are formed by a committee run by Steve Engler, who's sitting over there. Uh, um, he, he formed us, uh, has it been about eight years? Nine years now, we're in our ninth year. So the first Tuesday of every month, there's a schedule on the back table um, if you want to see what is uh, upcoming for the rest of the year. Tonight we have Herb Cavett talking about remote and exciting travel by bicycle. He's just come back from Thailand. I don't know if you're going to talk about that particular no, trip. No, no just no. <laughs> not so great. Herb graduated um, from MIT in 1958 as an engineer, but spent most of his life as an entrepreneur and writer. He wrote hundreds of short humor books with his wife. Likes to uh, his wife likes to describe as being of questionable taste. Um, still, all those books got published, mainly because he owned the publishing company. Uh, he is currently retired at 80. He skis all winter, bikes all summer, and plays with his grandchildren in between. Please welcome Herb Cavett. Are you going to put it in? Yeah, that would be a good spot go. for it. And then we clip this up by. How's that? How's it's that? like going to a, a doctor, you know, they're going to give you a needle of some sort. And I always ask for the OO needles, which are very thin, and they bring out this thing. It looks like it's about an inch and a half in diameter. I, I hate that. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm Herb Cavett. I, I live at uh, 69 Lincoln Road in Wayland, and I've lived here, I forget, maybe 40, 45 years. Uh, I'm 80 years old, and at 80, you forget a lot. Uh, I forgot why I signed up for this. I've been nervous all week. Who needs it? But I brought my wife along. Karen is sitting here. She's much younger than me. Karen is 47, 48, I forget also. But she's going to help me. She's going to give me some singles. If I'm talking too much, she's going like this. That means to cut it. And if she starts to roll her eyes, it means perhaps there's a little exaggeration in this story or that. And uh, I did want to say, anytime I'm at a lecture or a sermon, uh, I go to sleep immediately. I, I just doze right off. Now, today was a working day. Some of you may still work. I know, you know, James came directly from an operation, so he might be tired. If you want to nod off, take a nap. It's perfectly okay with me. <laughs> I would do it automatically almost. The only thing is, if you start to snore, Karen uses the elbow if you, if you do make a little bit too much noise. Uh, if anyone wants to use the restroom or anyone wants to, gets bored and wants to sneak out early, that's perfectly okay because I might as well. The door is right there. You can go. <laughs> Anyhow, I, my basic th uh, theme is you can't see the world from the window of an air-conditioned bus. And we have so many examples. We've traveled around the world, 50 or 60 different countries by bicycle. And so many little things happen that you know you can't see through a window. For example, one time in, uh, in New Zealand, we're just biking along and we heard a sound, a most beautiful bird sound that we've ever heard. I don't know what kind of bird it was. Maybe one my wife remembers, but not the kind of thing you can experience unless you're out there. Another time, we were biking in northern Vietnam, I believe. We had a great guide in northern Vietnam. Every time there was a hill going up, maybe four, five, ten miles, he'd say, the road's not so good here. We take van to top of hill. I love the guy. And then we got to ride down. We were riding down one time, and some kids come out of the, out of the forest and start to ride with us. They love riding with, uh, with a Western tourist. They can't believe, first of all, that we're on a bicycle. White people, Western people on a bicycle, that's what they ride. They can't conceive of it. Certainly, you're rich enough to have a motorcycle. Why are you on a bicycle? The kids come out, they love it. So we start racing down this long hill with these kids. And I let them you know, go a little ahead and a little behind and the screaming and yelling, and we're teasing each other, having a wonderful time. And we're coming down along a river. We get to the bottom of the hill, 
and I quickly take my camera out, give it to Karen. I say, Karen, quick, take a picture. So we all lined up to take a picture. And as she's peering through the, through the viewfinder, we hear a boom, there's an explosion, and a geyser of water comes flying up out of the river. And she's looking through the viewfinder. Nobody's there. I'm standing there. The kids are all gone. <laughs> so what happened? You know, it took me a few minutes to figure out what happened. Somebody was fishing with either dynamite or old hand grenades. And the kids were going to get the dead fish that float up to the surface. <laughs> you know, when on a bike, you're, you're none threatening to the locals. They're on a bike. You go by a school, especially in Africa, the kids all come out screaming, yelling. I don't know, God knows what the teacher's thinking, but the kids are all lined up screaming and yelling just because just they see you. Ah, and they're just making noise. In India, Everyone comes along and squeezes the tire. They go behind you squeezing the tire. I said, why are they squeezing the tire? This baffled me for the longest time. Even when you're riding, they're coming on, they're squeezing the tire. I finally asked the cyclist there, and he said, oh, they can't imagine that your, your tires are so narrow. They're so used to bigger balloon tires. Anyhow, what are some other experiences we've had? Oh, the street and village and, and wedding festivals. You're biking along, and you see a wedding. And of course, you stop, you're maybe you're taking a picture, and they always invite you in, which is kind of embarrassing because you're wearing a pair of bike shorts, you're sweaty, and a shirt, everyone is dressed up, or at least the bride and groom are dressed up. The wedding itself is lovely to see from a distance. Once you get into the wedding, which occasionally you, you have to do because they push you in, you have to watch out for the uncle. The uncle is drunk as a skunk, <laughs> and he starts pushing booze on you. He has some clear liquid that they distilled from a cactus plant. Just now. I don't know what it is. But the uncle has his arm around you, he's smelling a booze, and he's pushing it on you. You have another 40 miles to bike that day. You don't want the booze. You're trying to find places to dump it out before you, you know, get sick on the stuff. The village, the, uh, the festivals, and the contact with the people is magnificent. One time, I was biking in Ljubljana in Slovenia, and there was a, a fence around the city that the Italians built during World War II that has been made into a bike path. And I was biking around. Uh, Ljubljana at the time, and I ran to a couple, they're a lovely couple, and uh, we talked and talked and talked, and by the end of the ride, they invited us for dinner that night, which was lovely, I mean, it was touching, and it was very nice to see the inside of a local home and talk to the people. Uh, the thing that amazed us is the fellow was a pianist, and along with the dinner, he gave us a program and played classical music after the, uh, the dinner, put on a concert for us. I don't remember this, but Karen says that when we uh, approach villages in India, the bells are ringing. And it's just lovely coming into a town and having the bells sort of greeting you. In Africa, the kids on rusty old bikes, many of them don't have pedals, they just have the spindle. And they're barefoot, and they come out of the jungle and they see you, and they want to race with you. So you pretend you're racing with them, you're screaming and yelling, and the kids are right. Little kids, sometimes they can't reach the pedal, they're standing up. And as soon as they get an inch ahead of you, back into the jungle. They run back in. They're so happy. They beat the mazunga. They beat the white guy. They love this. Another thing that happens when you're on a bicycle, you're so close to the people. I've stopped so many times. Once in, uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, fishermen were bringing in a fishing net. It's an enormous net. And they pull it in on shore. And they get all the local people to help them pull it in because it's, it's such a big net. So I stop my bike, I'm wearing the bike shoes, I go down to the water, and I start helping them pull in this net. It was really just such fun to be working with these people, and they can't believe it. These are peasants, these are poor fishermen, and that this Westerner who got to be rich, my God, he's paying $70 a night at a hotel someplace, he's got to be worth a fortune, that he's helping them pull in this net. I mean, I've, I've harvested peanuts in, in Burma, I think we harvested peanuts. Other places picked tea. Um, threshed all kinds of things. You're, you're hitting with a funny stick. Usually they're better at the threshing than we are. But the peasants cannot believe that you're willing to stop and work with them. It's a real kick. The, uh, I, I have a note here that once we were at a monastery in, uh, I think in Burma, and the monks actually fed us. I mean, it, it, sometimes it, it amazes me that people that are so poor are taking care of, of, a, of an outsider like that. In, uh, in Cambodia, many people I've, I've talked to say, oh, yes, I've been to Cambodia. I said, uh, where did you go? And they went to Angkor Wat, which is the big 
a series of, of temples and magnificent, a magnificent site, and it's the prime tourist attraction in, uh, in Cambodia, Angkor Wat. But that's not Cambodia. What I remember most about Cambodia was not Angkor Wat with the hundreds of tourists and all the kids selling postcards. I remember a little girl along the way sharing her lunch with me. I, I couldn't believe it. We sat down, we were eating, and she was sharing her lunch with me in Cambodia. That was Cambodia to me, not Angkor Wat, which is sort of a big tourist place. There are two ways that we travel, uh, supported and unsupported. And supported, you have a car following you and you have a guide, and it's pretty much the only way you can go in, in uh, third world countries. You go to Mongolia or Madagascar or someplace like that, there's not a lot of maps, there's not a lot of roads, uh, you don't know where to go, you don't speak the language, it's tough. So going into a third world country, most often uh, we'll go with a guide. When we go by ourselves, we carry paniers. Paniers is a French word for a little bag that goes on your bike and it's too small to hold anything. Uh, over the years of travel, I've had so many breakdowns with bikes, you have to be able to repair everything on a bike to go by yourself. And every time I go, something breaks, I carry the tool for that or the extra part the next time. And once in Africa, I remember, we were by ourselves crossing a mountain. The group was, for some reason, someplace else. And Karen's pedal fell off. Not a pedal, her, her uh, crank. And I'm trying to fix it. We're in the middle of nowhere. And I'm trying to fix it with little sticks and little pieces of stone. It, nothing happened. I'm a little bit panicked. And then I took out this combination tool, and it had a 14-millimeter socket on the end of it. I never knew what it was for. I put this socket on the thing, and sure enough, that was what was needed to fix this, this crank, and we were able to get back. So from then on, I never travel without that tool. And this builds up over the years. So one of my paniers is filled with tools and guidebooks and language books and maps. And the other one, I have one pair of underwear. <laughs> when you carry, and one pair of biking shorts and a shirt. And when you travel this light, you have to be able to wash it out every night. I don't want to smell terribly. Sometimes I'll go two nights, but most often I, I wash it out every night. And my wife it gets tremendous joy because very often I have to sleep naked because everything is wet. <laughs> and uh, to washing out clothes in the sink in a hotel room is very simple. You, you know, wash it out, scrub it, dub, and it's done. It's the drying it that's a bit of a trick. I wrote an article on this in the newspapers uh, some years ago, how to dry clothes in cheap hotel rooms. The first thing, of course, everyone knows, you wring it out, you roll it in a towel, and you twist the towel, and it, it gets pretty dry. But my favorite methods, uh, or else if it's a warm climate, uh, if it's sunny out, you hang it out in the sun, it's dry in 20 minutes. If it's cold, you put it on a radiator or something. If it's in between, if there's lights, at least the old-fashioned kind of lights, generate heat, and you can drape the garment over the light. Of course, then you go out to dinner, and you come back, it's burned to pieces. But, <laughs> My favorite method of drying clothes in cheap hotel rooms, especially if they have a fan, I hang the garment on a, on a, on a uh, hanger, put it on the fan, spins around at slow speed, dry in 20 minutes. But after all of these different methods I had of drying clothes that I thought were so clever, in Japan, last uh, two years ago, I found the best of all. The Japanese have these very modern toilets that squirt you and blow you and dry you, and they're heated toilet seats. The toughest thing I have to... Uh, to dry a sock. Socks, for some reason, doesn't, don't dry. I don't know what they're made out of. But the toilet seat, curve of the toilet seat is exactly that of a sock. You put the sock on the toilet seat, 20 minutes, you have a dry sock. It was wonderful. So we go by ourselves and we wash out our clothes every night. If we go with a group, Well, I, I think you need a group for some place like Mongolia. How can you go to Mongolia without a group? What do you know about Mongolia? That said, I was biking once in Mongolia, and it was raining. We stopped at a little inn. I was with a group. We stopped at a little roadside place to get out of the weather. And inside, there's this young couple, a beautiful French girl in her 20s and her husband in her 30s. They had biked from Istanbul. I mean, it was inconceivable to me. And they said when they biked across Turkey that people were warning them, be careful when you get to Iran. Those people are terrible over there. When they get to Iran, the Iranian says, you came through Turkey? Oh, those Turks are murderous people. It's a miracle you got through. And they got to Tajikistan. It was the same thing. Every country, the people of the one before were terrible. Oh, when we're going by ourselves, uh, when we're going with Paniers, unsupported, we don't make reservations. We make a reservation the first night, the last night, and in between, we wing it. 
And it sounds nervous, but the best nights have been the nights when we couldn't find a hotel room. One time in Germany, it's getting dark. We're looking at the fortifications, the castle, and we're arguing to say the high-end uh, pension or the high-end hotel. We're going back and forth. I don't remember where we went, but the pension was full. We went to the hotel. It was full. OK, we'll stay wherever we can. We go down the line, finally a place that had toilets out in the back. Every place was full. There was evidently two or three weddings in the town that night. So I speak a few words of German. I ask somebody, and he points to this bridge. I know the bridge leads to France, but anyhow, we go on the bridge, and there's a little thing going down to an island. We drive down to the island, bike down to the island, and I go into the room. It's dark by this point. It's raining a little bit. We're desperate. And I go up to the desk, and I say, uh, in German, I say, haben Sie ein Zimmer free? Do you have a room free? He says, ja. It doesn't matter what it costs at this point. I'm going to pay for this room. I said, well, but I have to play the game. I said, wie viel kostet das Zimmer? How much does it cost? He says, 500, 500. And uh, this is, uh, you know, we're in Germany. I said, 500 marks, that's $300. Happily pay it, but it was a lot of money. He says, nine francs. And frank was 15 cents. <laughs> we had crossed into France without the slightest idea that we were in France then. Other times in uh, finding a hotel room in, uh, I guess this was again Germany, and we went to a town and there was supposed to be a hotel there, but it wasn't there. And the woman on the street said, oh, there it is up there. It's 1,000 feet up in the air somewhere. So he asked if there's a pension around. She said, well, I have one at my house. So we usually don't stay at pensions. It's a little scary. You don't know what you're getting. At any rate, we went. And as we put our bikes in the garage, we see there's a machine there that's squeezing grapes. They were making their own wine. What a lovely evening, drinking this wine that was unobtainable any place, kind of a sweet German wine, we happy as could be, stumbling around in my few words of German, a wonderful evening. Another time in Sicily, Karen was sick. She couldn't go. When she's there, she asks these silly questions. How far are we going? Is it hilly? Is there a hotel? Is there a town? All these, I was by myself. I have to do 150 miles. In the desperation, I can do it. I go off biking, leave at 8 o'clock. Three o'clock in the afternoon, I look at my watch. It gets dark at five. This was November. I'm halfway. I said, oh, Jesus Christ. We're, I'm in the middle of nowhere in, in Sicily on the top of a hill. Fortunately, it was downhill from there. I got to the town. And usually to find a hotel in a town, I look for the church steeple. I go down to the center of town. There's always a hotel there. I went in there, and the hotel was there all right, but it's under construction. I said, oh, God. I asked a policeman, uh, is there another hotel around? He said, oh, yes, it's up there. It's <laughs> a thousand feet back up the hills. Pedal back up. This is with the Paineers. Go into the hotel and uh, oh, thank God. Do you have a room? And he says, I'm sorry, we're full. I said, you know, please, please. I said, I'll, I'll sleep in the lobby. No, no, you can't do that. He says, this is another hotel. It's 20 kilometers down the road. I said, I'm on a bicycle. It's pitch black out. I don't have lights. So he took pity on me. He gave me an address. He hands me a piece of paper back down 1,000 feet into the town. I drive into the town. I'm looking for this address. And finally, I find a street. And it's up a set of steps. I'm carrying the bike and my bags. And finally, finally, there's a door. And I knock on the door. No one answers. I'm desperate by this point, knocking, knocking. And maybe I'll have to sleep in a church. I, it, finally, the door opens. And there's this beautiful young woman speaking perfect English, invites me in, $7 with breakfast. I mean, the nights that you can't find hotel have always been, well, I never told Karen that it was a beautiful young girl. <laughs> I'm seeing if I missed anything. Toilets, you got the toilet seat. That was important. <laughs> People always ask uh, two questions. One question is, what was your favorite place? And it's hard to answer because the favorite place depends on so many factors. It depends on the weather. If it's raining, it doesn't matter how gorgeous the country is. It's a miserable ride. It depends on the weather. It depends on the group you're with. Uh, and it depends on the political situation. One of our favorite trips was in Burma, Myanmar. We went there during the Troubles, when the monks were rioting and burning themselves and everything else, and no tourists were in the country. Nobody wanted to go to Burma at this period. We felt like we were the only people there. And there was some wonderfully, and the country itself is gorgeous. It should be such a prosperous country. They have all sorts of minerals. They have diamonds, and they have or sapphires or whatever. They have oil. They have coal. They have iron. They grow everything from corn to rice to potatoes. It's a wealthy country. But because of the military government, it's relatively impoverished. But anyhow, the first night, we uh, 
went to, uh, to cash our money, our dollars, into local currency. And I know enough when you go to a, a third world country, the money should be pristine. It should be just clean and lovely. And the money was, in my opinion, quite clean. We sat down with the guide, and I saw laying out the $20 bills uh, to cash into the local currency. And we were a bit nervous because we thought food was included on this trip. Turns out it wasn't, so we had to buy our own food. At any rate, we stopped putting down the money, and about a third of it was no good. No, this is no good. This is no good. This, oh, my God. My wife is panicked at this point. Oh, my God, we're going to starve to death. We don't have enough money to make it through the trip. We had laid out that we can spend $40 a day. She went out and bought a shirt or a garment or something. Oh, my God, we're not going to eat tonight. It turned out to be not such a problem because you can get a, a meal as a dollar on the street. It costs absolutely nothing. Uh, the only place we got into a little bit of a trouble was at the Western hotels where they were smart enough to charge Western prices. So suddenly you'd have a meal or two at the hotel and it was, it was expensive. I remember one night at the hotel in my belt, I always carry an emergency $100 bill all folded up. And I remember taking that bill out and washing it in the sink, <laughs> laying it on the table and ironing it, and then paying the bill with that $100 bill uh, on the bottom of the pile of money that I gave the fellow. But Myanmar, uh, Burma, was one of our favorite countries. Uh, we had one funny day. The uh, Karen didn't want to ride. And I said, OK, I'll start off. I left at 7 o'clock. And you just overtake me with the car. You know, whenever you catch up to me, I'll get in the van. And I went off, not realizing that the roads haven't been improved since the British left in 1947. The roads were pockmarked. No problem on a bicycle. You go around the holes. You keep biking along. The, tr the car couldn't catch up with me. I'm biking and biking, and it's hot, 40 miles, 45, where the hell are they? I'm biking and biking, they can't catch me. Karen told the story later, every t town that they came to, they'd ask, you know, the, the, the loiterer sitting there sipping tea, you seen a guy in the shirt like this? And they're, yeah, yeah, 20 minutes ahead. <laughs> I don't know how they finally caught it. Burma was a favorite country. Mongolia was magnificent, just because it's so remote, it's so far away. Uh, biking across the steppes. Not having, to peck, not having to stay on a path, you can go any place you want, just going across the grasslands. And how I learned to cross rivers, there were streams, fairly shallow streams, but all along the way. And I learned, in going to, through a stream perhaps as wide as this room, the first thing you think of is, I'll go real fast and just, Ugh! it doesn't work. You go in, the water stops you immediately. You just, just have to go into your lowest gear and pedal hard in getting across. I also learned, that if you go a little bit with the current, you get right across. Try to go the slightest bit into the current, you're dead. You're in the water, which the first time I tried, I was in. Uh, you can't go against the current in, in a country like that. Getting to uh, Mongolia was kind of an adventure in itself. I was going to take the Trans-Siberian Railroad across Russia. Very exciting to me. I put down my deposits on the trip. I was all set to go on flight reservations. And then when I realized I had to go across Russia, I had to get a Russian visa. So I applied for the Russian visa on a quick, quick, you pay extra money and you get it very quickly. And when I got the visa application, it says, have you ever been denied a visa to Russia? I said, oh my god. Back in the 70s, I went working with the refuseniks and the dissidents, and they arrested me on my fourth trip, and they wouldn't let me back in anymore. I was refused a visa to Russia. And I'm looking at this, I have all this money tied up in this trip, and I'm looking at this visa, and I have no way of getting to Mongolia. And then I realized, wait a minute, I was refused a visa to the Soviet Union, not to Russia. I said, oh, the hell with it. I checked no, and it went right ahead. So Mongolia was wonderful. Oh, Mongolia, the uh, yurts. The locals live in gurs, these round felt uh, things. And they're lonesome. They're out in the middle of nowhere with no television, no friends, no nothing. Though they do have motorcycles now to get around. But I was ahead of the group. The group was kind of uh, slow. And I would go off by myself. And when you come to a yurt, if you want to go to it, the cry, the greeting in Mongolia is, tie up your dogs. The dogs are not pets. They will eat you. So you have to, and I learned this in Mongolia in the future, tie up your dogs. That's the greeting you do when you approach a yurt, and they pacify the dogs so they won't eat you. You go into a yurt, and they're very, very hospitable. They, oh, they, you know, they give you their, their normal drink, which is mare, fermented mare's milk. Oh, I got nauseous just thinking about it. But you have to drink it. It's kind of bubbly, milk, warm. The thing that got me the most, and I don't know if I'm imagining this, but I, those little hairs in it from the mare. Oh, my God. The whole life is built around the mare's milk. They make it into cheese. They make it into everything. That's the, you know, the, the part of their culture. 
and they give you the measurement, and finally you get down one cup, and they fill it up again. It's <laughs> bloody awful. Um, they also had a custom of uh, one of the gifts that we were told to bring them is tobacco, which they uh, unobtainable in the middle of Mongolia, and you give them tobacco, they're very thankful. If, if you don't have tobacco to give them, you pretend to give it to them like this, and that's just as good. They're very happy with the pretending it. Um, Madagascar, that was the third favorite country. Madagascar, just because no one's ever been there. It's so bloody remote, uh, hard to get to. But Madagascar, I found a beautiful country, a potentially very wealthy country that is impoverished because of horrible government. When the French left, it left them just sort of hanging. When the British left some of their colonies, they set up a government. They left the people able to manage on their own. The French did not. The country has a corrupt government, as corrupt as possible. The educational system is horrible. People, teachers won't go to the hinterland to teach kids because there's no electricity there. There's no life there. So the kids don't start school till 9 or 10 or 11 years old. The education is terrible. The government's corrupt. And the third thing that has stopped any potential economic growth in Madagascar is the tribes. There are seven different tribes. And each tribe has some weird customs. For example, we bike down to the southern part of, of the island, and the, it's desert there. People have to walk two days to get a, a, you know, a thing of water to come out. The life is horrible. Meanwhile, in the middle of the country, it's just lovely with the lemmers and the forest and the green and the farmland all over the place. And I asked the guy, why don't these people move to the center of the country? Oh, the custom in this tribe is you die where you were born, so they won't move to the center. Another tribe, their custom is when someone dies, and when they die, they, they put the bones in, in the rocks, and you see them all over the place. But when someone dies, they have an enormous orgy to reproduce life and uh, re, you know, replenish their tribe. In the time of AIDS and, and sexually transmitted diseases, it's devastating. The government has been trying to cut it out because of the disease that's being spread by these orgies that they have every time somebody dies. I like Madagascar. <laughs> Oh, another thing that was nice in Madagascar, there were so few people that had seen anyone on bicycles. No hands were out for money. In any country, where, where, if you're the second bicyclist through a third world country, every kid, pencils, pencils, hands out. Um, there was nothing like that. In Madagascar, they just smiled and looked at you and, and wanted to welcome you because they just weren't used to uh, begging as, they, as it would be. There was some, one woman in the group had the guy tran I changed some money into very small bills, and one day I saw the guy giving out these 10 cent pieces essentially to kids. I was horrified and yelled at her. You just don't do that. We've learned a long time ago to give things to kids is, <clears throat> is devastating. If you give them something of value, you turn them into beggars. They ask for pens in some third world countries, or what they usually do, they just, it's a, sim uh, a status symbol to collect pens. They're really not using them in school. And of course, giving them money is terrible. You turn them into beggars. Giving them candy, which every tourist does, is horrible because they have no teeth care whatsoever. There's no dental care. Uh, I learned a long time ago what to give. When we were in uh, places like Nepal and Bhutan, I gave kids b uh, balloons. And they <laughs> blow up the balloon. They're thrilled, makes great pictures, and you're not destroying them in any way. When we went to Burma, I brought toothbrushes and a little packs of toothpaste. And the ki kids don't care what it is. They're getting something. They're thrilled. Uh, giving money or giving candy is terrible. To think of something clever, helping the country an awful lot. Oh, the other question people ask, besides favorite countries, uh, have you ever felt threatened? The one that I'm proudest of, one early trip we were in Kenya, and Karen was taking a nap. We had just arrived, and I went walking in the streets to see what, you know. And of course, as soon as you walk in the street, a guy comes up and says, oh, where are you from? Good English. And this is a standard pitch to get you into his uncle's rug shop or whatever. But this is a young fellow. He said, where are you from? I said, Boston. He says, oh, I've just been accepted at MIT. I have so many questions. I wonder if you can help me. Oh, my goodness. I said, I went to MIT. I'll be happy to help you. And it, I was aghast. That I, I recognized that this is in probability this is a little bit phony. But perhaps this was a poor kid. So how'd you get into MIT? Well, I got a scholarship. And I took the test. And we did. we're walking along. And he's going on and on about how he got in. And, and uh, I said, what would you like to know? And he's hemming and hawing, and we're walking. And we're not on the sunny street where the hotel is any longer. Suddenly, 
the neighborhood's deteriorating a little bit. And I'm, I understand the game with these people that come up asking to speak English. I recognize that uh, it's either his uncle's rug shop or I'm about to be mugged. And I ask him, I said, well, tell me, what would you like to know about MIT? He says, well, he says, it's not polite to talk on the street. Let's go someplace. Uh, now, now I'm at 80% certain that I'm going to be mugged. There'll be three friends there with knives, and I'm about to be taken for a ride. And I'm thinking, even though I'm almost positive I'm about to be mugged, I said, maybe there's a small chance this kid really did get into MIT and really needs some help. I said, I've got to think of some tests. We're walking along. The neighbor's deteriorating. Finally, I said, aha. I said, tell me. How many places do you know the value of pi to? He said, huh? I said, pi, as in pi r squared or 2 pi r squared, you know, a circle. He said, oh, he got very nervous. Oh, I, I, I've just been accepted at MIT. I haven't been there yet. I haven't learned anything. Said, Goodbye. <laughs> I'm back to the sunny streets. And this was too much for me. Another time in uh, Pakistan. I, Pakistan is the one country I'll never go back to. That was a scary place. Uh, you see no women in the country. And, it's, it's a very close society. We're bicycling down the Karakoram Highway. It's very hot, 114 degrees and no shade whatsoever. And we stopped at a little roadside inn place to get some drinks. And uh, I went to use a restroom, which was upstairs, uh, kind of a narrow spiral staircase. It was really square more than a spiral. But I'm walking up this dark staircase. And in the middle of the staircase coming down is a Pakistani family, two or three women, two or three guys. and. I was thinking, I, I just kind of brushed by them. Well, they are horrified. I am brushing by their women in the full shadows. I, I mean, what I should have done is backed off and gone. I never, I could see them reaching, for, now this is later in my mind, I could see them reaching for their knives. They were ready to, to, to murder me on the spot. And of course, by this time, I'm by them, and they probably thought better of it and kept on going. But I thought that was one of the more dangerous things I've, I've ever done. In Cuba one time, uh, we were there, and there was a hurricane. Electricity was out, and we were leaving Havana on this particular day. And we get to a, a street, and there was some traffic on it, but there were no traffic lights because uh, electricity was out because of the hurricane. And I saw a truck coming, but I had time to make it. So I biked across the street. My wife wisely stayed on the sidewalk. I, I start biking across, and I could make it. And as I just about get to the truck, I see a Volvo coming down on the inside of the truck where he shouldn't have been. And I said, oh, this is trouble. But he, you know, he can easily brake, but this is Cuba. They don't have brakes. They don't have cars. The cars are these old, rotten things. And suddenly I realized that this car can't stop. And I'm between a truck coming down on me and a Volvo coming down on me. And I jump off the bike and turn them sideways. And the cars go by me on either side. Oh, my God. My wife, meanwhile, is standing on the corner thinking, how will I get the body home? Because we, <laughs> we snuck into Cuba. We're not supposed to be there. Actually, the one time I really came close to death, uh, in Argentina, I just got sick. I didn't know what was wrong. I felt sick. And for the first time in my life, I aborted the trip, somehow got to the airport. They got me on a plane. I flew back to Boston, and uh, Karen had left a car for me at the airport. I somehow got home. I remember weaving all along Mass Turnpike. I couldn't stay in, in a lane. I didn't know what was wrong. Was just, and I got home, and I called Jordan Bush, my friend and doctor, and he sent an ambulance over for me right away, rushed me to the hospital. I still had no idea what was happening. I remember them putting oxygen on me, and I'm pulling it out. And it turns out I was in septic shock. Everything was failing. The kidneys were failing. The lungs were failing. Everything's failing. And I'm bewildered as to what happened. But after a couple of hours of tests, they found out that I had an anaplasmosis bacteria that I picked up from a tick in my backyard in Wayland. And that, that probably came close. Because if I had stayed in Argentina another day or two, I doubt that they would have found what it was. Those were my dangers, and those were my favorite places. What time is it? 8 o'clock. Ah. Uh, I was going to talk a little bit about different countries I've been to. In Vietnam, the people were so friendly, so nice. The high school girls in the white outfits, I forgot what they're called, riding along just placidly on their upright bicycles. Absolutely lovely. Country so warm and welcoming. And after what we did to them, it's, you, know, you feel so bloody guilty that people are so nice, especially when you see people that are maimed from the war, and still they're just so happy to see you. One thing we noticed in, uh, in Vietnam, uh, the guy pointed out that there was a little cage on the back of a bicycle, and there were some little puppies in it. And he said, oh, those are dog nappers. They steal these puppies, and then they eat them. 
well, I'm horrified at this. My God, these poor little puppies in the back. And uh, I, biking along a day or two later, I saw a bicycle parked by a house, and there was a cage in the back with a couple of puppies in it. So I stopped to take my, my camera to take a picture, and the guy, one of the Vietnamese, comes running out and yelling, no, 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 no. But hell, he's just a little Vietnamese guy. I've been doing my martial arts for 40 years. I'm not worried about him. And then another guy, second guy, comes out of that house and says, oh, God, where's the guide now? And, and then a third guy comes out of that house. It was time to go. I got back on my bike and, and rode away. This was getting too scary. But Vietnam was a, a lovely country. We had, they had such funny um, customs. I mean, our guide, who was an educated college, educated fellow, he told us that uh, diarrhea is caused by air conditioning and that if you touch a monkey, you'll get leprosy. And after a woman, uh, when a woman gives birth, they keep her in a room with fires burning and stoves. A month, of, I mean, four weeks is an enormous amount of time. Couldn't conceive of the heat that must be generated in those rooms. And this poor woman is sitting there with a the baby. Even when we went up to a modest altitude, 3,000 feet, I think it was, in the highlands of Vietnam, and the people all wearing sweaters and bundled up. It's 80 degrees, and we're dying. And everyone there has mufflers on and sweaters. This was freezing. This was wintertime for them. The toughest trip I took was in Central Asia. Started in Kazakhstan. God knows why I signed up for this one. It was a four-week trip. From Kazakhstan, we biked to Kyrgyzstan, and from Kyrgyzstan into uh, China, and then to Pakistan. Many, many adventures on this trip. The reason I went, they said that the military roads that the Soviet Union had built between them and China were deteriorating, and that if you didn't go now, you're not going to be able to go anymore. The roads are not going to be there. So I got very excited, signed up with a bunch of young um, English guys that were on the trip. And there was one uh, older, older my age, uh, <coughs> an American couple from California, they're probably 50 or 55, I was about the same at the time. The first day of the trip, we're up high and biking along, and the uh, American couple comes out with paniers on their bike. And the, every, these young kids say, what are you doing with paniers? You're going to slow us up. You can't ride fast with paniers. And they said, well, we like to ride with these. And they said, absolutely not. You can't do it. And they insisted. A bit of an argument. And the group started off. And they were in the back with their paniers. And it started to rain. And then sleet and snow. It was bloody freezing. We came to a, just a shack. And we huddled under the shack. And there was some woman there who paid no attention to us until the guide offered to pay her for some tea. So she made some tea for us. We were freezing up there. The guide had just a biking shirt on a pair of shorts. I was smart enough. I had a rain gear. I, I, I was warm. But the, most of the kids there were just in biking clothes. And it's snowing. And then 10 or 15 minutes later, this couple comes along with their paniers. And they gave out sweaters. And they gave out hats. And they oh, gave yeah. out gloves. <laughs> no one complained after that. Everyone <laughs> it was very, very happy with them. The roads were so bad on that trip. They were just washed out. Uh, we couldn't make it. We, the younger guys would take their bikes and climb and climb and climb and then finally turn back. And one night, uh, we, the road was just not there. We had to go back, get in the vehicle, and ride around the mountain. We came around the mountain, and they made arrangements at a motel that night. And the motel, if you can call it a motel, it was a room. the bottom floor was the rooms all had sheep in them. We joked that, of course, you had to pay a little extra if you wanted a sheep in your room. But the outhouses were out, there were two filthy outhouses on the outside, and everyone just grabbed a bed, went to sleep, and uh, hopefully found something better the next day. When we finally crossed from, uh, from uh, Kyrgyzstan into, into China, oh, in Kyrgyzstan also, there was no uh, sanitation, there was no food. You know, in the military, when you are setting up next to a river, up here, you draw the water for food. And then over here, you, you, you know, do some cooking. And down here, you wash your clothes. And down here, the animals drink. And down finally, at the end, you wash your cars. In Kyrgyzstan, they, and the toilets were down there. In Kyrgyzstan, the toilets were up here. And then the animals and the cars, I mean, the sanitation was so bad, everyone was violently sick. There was food was atrocious. There was nothing to eat. I lost about 20 pounds on that trip. There were animals all around. We were there, out in the steppes of Russia, the people were herding sheep. And I remember saying, guys, let's buy a sheep. We'll have lamb chops tonight. We had no food. And it was a wonderful idea, but no one knew how to kill and skin a sheep. We didn't, had no idea what to do. That didn't work. We finally got to uh, China. And the Chinese 
Russian border, they warned us when you get to the border, the Chinese guards will try out your bike. You know, they want to get on your bike and try it, and they have the guns, so you have to let them sit, put your bike in the highest gear so they can't possibly pedal. If you have time, pull up your seat, and they'll get on the bike, they'll fall off, and it'll all be over. And indeed, it did happen. The Chinese guards got out. They wanted to get on your bike, but they couldn't. When we crossed from, in, in China, the food was wonderful, and uh, um, you know, started to gain back some weight. When we went from China, stand, China into Pakistan, I thought of the same thing. The, the Chinese guards are going to uh, want to ride the bikes, but there we had crossed the border, and the Chinese didn't have guns anymore, so we'd, you know, we'd say, get out of here. We wouldn't let them uh, fool with the bikes at all. And uh, something else happened there on the Chinese border. Oh, in crossing borders like this, it's, it's a tough border. The Chinese-Russian border at that time was an armed border. They were, China and Soviet Union were not, were competing terribly at the time. This was Russia now, not the Soviet Union, but the border was a tough border. The night before crossing the border, we were going to take a six-wheel drive uh, Russian vehicle over the border. We're sitting in the yurt around the fire, and we hear a motorcycle roar up. And we, you know, the guy, young guy who's about 28 years old, goes to the door. The motorcycle pulls up, and this figure comes out all in black leather and whips off the helmet. And this gorgeous blonde hair comes cascading down. The guy turns into, like, he's, he's speechless. And she says, I, I'm, I'm going to, she was an Australian girl. She was, wanted to cross into China. And she said, I don't have a visa. I said, this, is, this is hopeless. She said, can I sneak in with you guys tomorrow? There were 10 of us. And the guy, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Please. You know, he was, he was in, infatuated. He said, fine, sure, you can come with us. As soon as she left, I said, wait a minute. I said, what, are you crazy? We have visas for 10 of us. You're going to try to smuggle in 11th person. We'll all be in jail. We're not going to go anyplace. He said, you know, you're right. Let's leave early. We left like at 4 in the morning. We'll leave early in the morning before she can, before she can catch up with us. So we left early. I don't know whatever happened to her. On the way to the border, uh, our truck was stopped and commandeered by a bunch of Russian uh, military people. And we were annoyed. We're all sitting around on the floor of this big, ugly vehicle. But after a while, you're riding with somebody. You're riding along. And, and uh, you start sharing drinks with them and candy with them. And as it turns out, they were the border guards. We got to the border. <laughs> we went right through. Without knowing somebody or knowing what to do, when crossing into a place like China, you're on a bus. And, you, and the poor peasants that are there with bundles of stuff, they're spread out. All of their belongings are spread out by the side of the road. Meanwhile, when the guides know what to do, whether it's a bottle of vodka or a, or a package of cigarettes, they would go right through and, and off we'd go. <clears throat> Though I do remember in Pakistan, there was one poor fellow. He was a seaman. He was a black guy, and he had these dreadlocks. And every time there was a checkpoint and someone stopped, the button stopped, he would be outside. They'd be searching him. He was so annoyed. Oh, for God's sake, how come they always pick on me? Well, he looked, he looked scary to them. <laughs> That was the roughest trip I took. I come, came home with very, very skinny. In India, we love India. Uh, the people are so friendly, watching you quietly, squeezing your tires every place they can. Oh, one experience. In Delhi, I love New Delhi. There's a hotel there called the Imperial Palace of a hotel. Old British hotel, gorgeous. It was expensive. I stayed there years ago when it was cheaper, but the last trip, suddenly the hotel, I was with Karen. We were going to bike in Rajasthan. And uh, Alto was expensive, so I wrote to the uh, PR department. I said, gee, I'm a travel writer. A little bit of an exaggeration. I said, I'm a travel writer. Might you have a, you know, a special deal for me? And they wrote back and forth. We went back and forth, and they finally gave me a very reasonable price. I said, fine. We arrive at the hotel about 1 or 2 in the morning. All planes coming into India arrive at these god-awful hours. So we get, in there, get to the hotel at 1, 2 in the morning. Walk in the front door, tired and bedraggled. There are photographers there meeting us. I said, oh, God almighty, they believe me. <laughs> photographers are taking pictures. They take us up to this palace of a room. I mean, flowers and scotch and candy and two bathrooms and three rooms. I was beyond, God. oh, my God, they believe me. The next day, we're, we're, we're going down these marble hallways, these gorgeous hotels, wheeling our bicycles and our biking stuff, mortified, absolutely mortified. I never tried that one again. <laughs> in, in Rajasthan, I remember staying at these Maharaja palaces. One hotel we stopped at, you come there and they sit you down in a, in a beautiful room and uh, they start filling out passport 
names and all that sort of stuff. And going through everything, and finally we were all done. I said, oh, thank you very much. Where's our room? And they said, oh, this is your ante room. The room that we're in is almost as big as this one was the ante room for our, our palatial staying. I mean, the hotels there are just beyond magnificent. India is a very exciting place. I love the Indian food. Once you get up high, two, 3,000 feet, the weather is cooler. And uh, had some wonderful experiences uh, in India, a wonderful place to bicycle. South Africa. We biked in South Africa years ago during apartheid. We had a guide who was an idiot, a total idiot. At one point, we were uh, uh, in a van in a game park. In a game park, you stay inside the vehicle because they're tight, they're not tigers, they're lions and all sorts of wild animals around. We're riding in the van, there are animals all over the place. This guy runs out of gas. I'm sitting there, my God almighty, you know, in the middle of the game park, it's like a desert with lions. <laughs> Anyhow, he flags down another car, gets into it, goes to buy us gas, and we're left in this hot car sitting out there in the sun. After a while, what do you do? You open the door, and after a while, we open the door, stand outside. Other people are coming along and saying, what are you doing? Get in the car, there are lions out here. <laughs> this was about the worst guide we ever had. Um, one funny experience in, in uh, South Africa, I was biking by myself for some reason. I had left the group, and I'm biking along, and I, I saw this like a resort, a country club. And I went there, and it's hot, and it's a magnificent pool. It must have been a 50-yard pool, maybe 100 yard, Gorgeous pool. Beautiful. No one there. I went, took off my shirt. I had my biking shorts on, took off my shoes, and I dived in swimming around. It was lovely. And I look up, and there's one or two uh, Indian people there. And they, they're kind of looking at me, staring at me incredulously. I even got dressed and biked off. I realized later there were three classes of people during apartheid. Yeah, the blacks, the Indians, and the whites. And I had been swimming in an Indian swimming pool. And they, were, they were aghast that I had been doing this. At one point, uh, I think we went through Soweto at that time, which was supposed to be very dangerous. But that was uh, on a tour and not very exciting. New Zealand, ah, the friendliest people in the world. I always like to joke that people from Australia and New Zealand, if they weren't friendly, nobody would come visit them. They lived too far away. <laughs> the first day, we were biking from Christchurch. We made a reservation the first night. We were biking along. There was a strong headwind. We were struggling and struggling. It was probably 50 or 60 miles. All of a sudden, the car pulls up. It says, Herb. I said, well, I don't know a soul in this country. It turns out the woman from the inn that we were staying at recognized there was a headwind, drove down halfway to pick us up. Oh. And Karen jumped in the van, threw the pain years in, and I, I biked the rest of the way. Such friendly, wonderful people. Another day, we were biking along in New Zealand, and the car pulls up alongside. Hey, you folks want some fudge? <laughs> and they gave us some fudge. There's a, I think it was a magpie, a bird. We're biking one day, and a magpie, we must have been near its nest. They, the magpies attack you. I don't know if I have the right bird, but luckily we had helmets on. This bird is diving at us. We're in terror. It's really quite terrifying to have this bird diving on you, trying to peck you. And uh, I think the helmets were the only thing that made us feel at all comfortable. New Zealand was just magnificently beautiful. The sounds, that bird that we heard in New Zealand was so wonderful. Oh, Japan, God almighty. That was a mistake. We decided to do Japan on our own. We rented a car. We we're going to drive out to something called the Noto Peninsula, where there were bike trails. Get to the airport. We got the Japanese car. The driving is on the right side. And the fellow who gave us the car kept saying, remember, stay on the left side of the road. Yeah, we got that. We start to leave the airport. Can you imagine being at Logan Airport with arrivals, departures, telephone lot, all in Japanese. We don't know what we're doing. We're trying to get out of the airport to go to a hotel. We're driving around. The signs were bewildered. Finally, we get to a spot, and there's a row of booths, and we pull up, and it's a secure area of some port. Policemen come out with the white clubs, and I, I, I were looking around. A lot of policemen came out. <laughs> and I, I, I just go like this, and he, he calls more, he blows his whistle. Eight policemen come out, and they stop all the traffic. They open up a gate, and they drive us around, and we go out to the gas. Oh, God, thank God we're at it. We're driving around the airport. 20 minutes later, we're back in the same spot. I can't <laughs> believe it. But back there, the guy didn't even get blows the whistle, and the eight policemen come out, and we get out again. Oh, it was tough driving in Japan. Another experience we had, we... Uh, 
we're trying to get on an expressway to get to this Noto Peninsula. We're driving through traffic and finally there's an entrance to the expressway. Oh, wonderful. Like, pull up to the thing and there's a barrier there. It's all in Japanese, of course. And there's a place you put cards and money and I have no idea what this is. is and there's a board and the, something. I push a button and the Japanese guy comes, hop, 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 hop. I don't know what he's talking about. And I thought, oh my God, well, I better back out of here. So I go to back out. Oh, there's a car behind me. I'm trapped. So again, I push the button, but he's speaking Japanese. I don't know what to do. I can't go forward. I can't go back. And while I'm, I'm just, all of a sudden, there are like four or five cars behind me, and I'm, I'm trapped. I don't know what to do. Finally, a kindly Japanese, they're very patient, wonderful people, comes out. He talks to the guy in the thing, and a gate opens, another gate opens there, and they, they manage to pull out. I mean, the efficiency of that country is beyond belief. Besides the toilets that have heated toilet seats. I mean, it was wonderful there. But in, in, uh, another trip that I took to Japan, it was a very authentic trip, staying at Ryokin's. And every morning, you'd break all the meals we were eating on the floor. And when I tell people, they're so horrified at, at some of these meals. It was raw horse meat. Uh, many meals had raw horse meat, which actually, that was one of the better things. Some of these funny little crustacean things like <laughs> miniature crabs, everything's raw. Uh, horrifying. One breakfast, I, I, was, I was getting desperate, actually, at this point. There was a raw egg, and there's always rice. Thank God you can make a meal out of the rice. But there was this raw egg, and I'm hungry, and I'm looking around. I say, you know, they always have really hot tea. I pour the tea into a bowl, take the egg, put it into the thing, make a soft-boiled egg, break it over my bowl of rice. Absolutely, it was the best breakfast. In fact, I, I keep thinking I should make that more often at home. Another time in Japan, uh, we, were look we finally got to this Noto Peninsula after hair-raising rides on narrow roads on the wrong side of the road and long, dark tunnels. We get to the Noto Peninsula. We go to this lovely hotel, and we said, like a room, spoke a few words of English, and they have this symbol if they're full. <laughs> that means the hotel's full. <laughs> go down the road a little way. There's another hotel. We go in the hotel. <laughs> the hotel's full. Oh, Jesus. This is getting serious. There are only three hotels in the town. Go to the third hotel, and again, <laughs> they're full. I didn't know what to do. We went to the railroad station thinking they'll have a service of some sort. They didn't speak any English there. By the grace of God, there were some Australian girls that were studying in Japan, spoke a few words of Japanese, and there were lots of problems, but somehow they found a Ryukin, a traditional Japanese inn for us. It was hotter than hell in July, a bad time to go to Japan, as I learned later. We finally go to this Ryukin thinking it's going to be a rough night's sleep. It's hot. We're going upstairs, and it just boiling hot, and then they slide open these paper doors, and there's an air-conditioned room with a thing of tea there and the beautiful beds, and they bring in little snacks for you. It was just so lovely. Some very hard times in Japan, some very lovely times as well. Raw horse meat. It's actually pretty good. In Sri Lanka, some of the things that you learn on, on trips, the uh, tsunami in so 2000, 2004, the tsunami. A lot of people died, 50,000 here and all that. Sri Lanka was really hit. The thing that was seared into my memory, they have a, a train that was hit by the tsunami. And this is a you know, full passenger train. I forgot how many people were killed just in that train, but this train is twisted and torn. It's all lying there. It really showed you the force of that, of that thing. It's quite frightening to see the, uh, the train. In Sri Lanka, I had another weak guide. The guy didn't like to bicycle. He didn't want to go up hills. He said, oh, I can't go up this hill. Better take van. But the thing that got me with this guy in particular was uh, we got to a spot, and it was a hill again. He didn't want to ride up the hill. He says, too dangerous. Elephants on this hill. Can't go up this hill. A lot of elephants in Sri Lanka. So I just said, I disobeyed him. He said, go, leave me alone. I went up the hill. Uh, and of course, there were no elephants there. But uh, you have a guy like that that's afraid of bicycles. <clears throat> it's a week, a week, a week trip to have someone like that. Sri Lanka was a very hot but a lovely country. <laughs> In Nepal, one time, the uh, we had to fly from the capital of Kathmandu into this t village way up high on a little dirt strip, and then we were going to bike back to wherever. And <clears throat> as we're flying in this little plane. The uh, pilot said, uh, or the guide said to us, you know, the, the pilot, it was, weather was bad. The pilot, I know, was looking at a road map, looking out the window, I, said, I don't like this one bit, the plane's bouncing around. And the guide said, the pilot didn't want to go, but the, his boss talked him into it. <laughs> Great. 
uh, in the Himalayas, we've biked a lot in the Himalayas, in Sikkim, in Nepal, and um, northern India. You see one of the saddest things I saw, the building of roads there, where the women, the poor women, mostly from southern India, would be sitting by the side of the road with a metal ring, and they'd take stones and a hammer, and they would break the stones into gravel. Mm -hmm. And it, just sitting there, breaking their stones into gravel, and then they would have... 55-gallon uh, drums filled with tar, and uh, the men would come with the drums and pour the tar over the crushed stone, and that would be a road. And I remember talking to the guy, I said, isn't it so terrible that these women are out there crushing stones with a hammer? He said, if it wasn't for that, that hammer and that ring, these people would, wouldn't have a job. This was a job already. Uh, it, was, it was very sad. These people were living underneath trucks. It would be raining. They'd be lying underneath the truck breaking the stones. Uh, that was real poverty. This was in Nepal. Uh, in Nepal and, and uh, Bhutan, it's all up or down. You're either going up a mountain, down a mountain. The only place that's level is at the bottom where you're crossing the bridge. Uh, <clears throat> I stopped going to these places. It's too hard. I uh, made a rule after <clears throat> last trip to, uh, you know where it was, someplace or less. I said, no more, no more hot weather, no more hills, and no more squat toilets. I want Europe someplace that's civilized and lovely and clean. And we had such wonderful trips in Europe where there are bike paths, <coughs> lovely bike paths down the Danube from Passau, Germany to Budapest. And we bike down this, this path. It's flat all the way, slightly downhill, beautiful hotels. Biking in Europe is a joy. There's another bike trip around the Bowdoin Sea through Switzerland and uh, Austria. Uh, Switzerland, Austria, something else. Liechtenstein, was it? Germany. And it, uh, it's a three or four day bike ride around the lake and hotels all the place, flat, lovely, clean, everything wonderful. Biking in a place like Switzerland, I remember one point we came along and you could see the, the, the car road is going and it's going through a mountain, it's going into a tunnel. And I said, uh oh, this is going to be rough. We're going to either have to go with the cars or we're going to have to climb this, this big hill. We got there and there was a tunnel through the mountain strictly for bikes. It was about a kilometer long. It was well lit, and it didn't smell of urine. It was just this beautiful, and there was no other people there. We just went through this tunnel. The infrastructure in Switzerland is so perfect. It's embarrassing when you think of Swiss, Swiss people coming here and seeing the rusty bridges and the broken up roads and where everything in Switzerland was so immaculate, even the bike paths. Oh, I had a funny experience. In, uh, we were in Berlin after the, final, the soccer final between Germany and Brazil. Germany lost. And we were biking around. We saw the German kids with the flags over their shoulders walking down kind of sad. And the Brazilian kids very proud they had won with the yellow green flag. And Karen went to the hotel. And I said, oh, I want to bike around a little bit. I started biking around. And the crowds started gathering after this game. And it, it turned into a riot. There were crowds. The streets totally blocked all the, uh, any automobile traffic. And I saw police trucks coming up, and you know, 20 policemen would come out with black helmets and all that. And everything is just stopped dead, and, and people are throwing bottles and firecrackers and noise. It's a full-scale riot. And I had been in one or two before. I know to you stay back. You don't want to get in the middle of these because they are dangerous. And at one point, I saw this car filled with Brazilian fans. They had a flag, and it was all Brazilians in this car, and the windows are rolled up. And a group of German kids get around the car, and they start rocking it. I said, oh, God, I'm backing off more because I know what's coming. They're rocking the car. All of a sudden, it's going to explode. This is going to be bad. They're rocking the car, rocking them. The Brazilians inside are in terror. They're just terrified. And then the Germans could stop. They get them to roll down the window. They shake hands with them, apologize, and go off. I said, God, they've learned something. I know as we went to different concentration camps around Europe, every one, there was always a group of German kids there respectful, polite, not like kids would usually be running around. Uh, we Probably six or seven concentration camps that we visited, there were always were groups of German kids there. By God, they have learned. I mean, after they shook hands with those Brazilian kids, when they were so upset having lost that soccer match to them, <clears throat> I was very impressed with that. Oh, in the Netherlands, they would laugh at our helmets. We're biking with helmets. Everyone wears a helmet here. In Holland, where they have the most bike culture of any place in the world, 
bike paths every place. In fact, the law in Holland is if a car hits you and you're on a bike, it's automatically the car's fault. It doesn't matter what you've done. But they would laugh. We'd go by a cafe and they'd look at us with the helmets. They'd roar with laughter. Go, no. <laughs> I biked in uh, Israel several times. I went with the, uh, with the military. There was a friends of the Israeli Defense Force and they <clears throat> I kind of got roped into this trip and I looked at the itinerary and it was 100 miles a day. And it was six or 7,000 feet of climbing. And once a year, I'd bike from my place up in Vermont to uh, Boston, to Wayland, and it's 150 miles. And I do it in one day, no problem. But then I rest for two weeks. I can't get out of bed. <laughs> Here, this ride was 100 miles every day. And I look at it, I said, I can do it one day, maybe two days. After that, I don't have a prayer. I did it on caffeine. I learned when I was racing, caffeine really works. I don't drink coffee. And every morning, I get up and drink three, four cups of black coffee and somehow manage the 100 miles and the six or 7,000 feet. Uh, the trips were very exciting because of the military that were with us. <clears throat> At one point, uh, two years ago, we were right on the Syrian border, and you know, we heard the explosions. You could see the explosion in the, in the distance and hear the rattle of machine guns. And uh, the fellow who was lecturing us on the uh, particular battle, the battle that took place in 1973, was the, the fellow who actually stopped the 600 Syrian tanks that were invading Israel at that time is an incredible story. And the tanks are still there. All the ruins of them are right out in the field. And the background, the fighting in Syria was going on. It was a very moving, moving spot to be. I took a trip in Laos uh, uh, last year. And uh, it was so muddy on one road, it had rained, that we couldn't get through. We gave up finally. And at a little house, we stopped. And the farmer, farmer's wife called her husband somehow. And, got on a tractor, and he pulled us out of the uh, thing. We couldn't get out on bicycles. The mud was just too thick. I think that's when I decided no more hot weather, no more hills. You learn so much when you're at, uh, in countries like this. In, uh, in Turkey, we went to Ephesus. I biked to Ephesus in Turkey. I loved the food in Turkey, uh, the people. Everything was wonderful. The village that we stopped at, I stayed there an extra day or two at the beginning to make sure I'd be there on time. and. Uh, it was a Greek village. It was all Turkish now. And it dated back, I suppose, to the wars in the 1920s when the Greeks were all expelled from Turkey and from the Greek parts of, uh, of Greece, the Turks were shoved out. And uh, thousands, probably millions of people were killed in this, in this exchange. And there we were at this little stone, beautiful little Greek village and suddenly realized what misery must have gone on in this village. You learn so much in traveling these places, things that at home, you just don't see things, you know. And also, in a place like uh, Cyprus, where it's divided between Greek and Turkish, thing, something is not on our radar. Radar, but we went across the border from the Greek part of Cyprus to the Turkish part, and we had to be back by five o'clock, or something terrible happened. And you realize, my God, this country has been divided since I don't know how many years now—30, 40 years—and. Uh, the Turkish part was beautiful, as was the Greek part. It's a wonderful island in Cyprus. No one locked anything up. You can tell, I can always tell about the crime in a city by how big the locks are on a bicycle. In a place like the Netherlands, you ride out in the countryside and the bikes are secured by a little thing, a little thing that goes through the spokes. You get to Amsterdam and the motorcycle chains are three times, and the bikes are worth nothing. A rusty old bike, and they have nine chains wrapped around and locked to an iron fence. In Cyprus, no one locked up anything. A very lovely cultural place. Oh, in the Balkans, Dubrovnik, Croatia. Lovely part of the world. Dubrovnik was magnificent, and uh, the riding was beautiful there. We had a very funny experience. We came to another town, I think it was Spit, and we didn't have a room. We don't make reservations. I s saw a sign on the door. It said, room for rent, son. I knock on the door, and a guy came and asked him how much it was. And it was, it was kind of expensive. But then we said we wanted it for three nights, and the price came down to a very reasonable amount. I think Karen went, my wife went upstairs to look at the place. And I was making a deal with the guy. It wasn't too expensive. It was air conditioned. It was, several, it was two or three floors. And uh, so we made the deal, and he left. And Karen kind of back with wide eyes, <laughs> saying, what are we doing? It turns out. It was a bordello of some sort, a, a homosexual bordello, we believe. <laughs> Everything was red and mirrors and ointments and, oh, God, all right, the place, and hot tubs and, ba I, it was terrifying. I mean, we just, 
well, what have we done? We're stuck there for three nights. I'm afraid to. <laughs> we use lots of soap. Uh, something that happened, we've visited many communist countries. <clears throat> in Vietnam, we had a guy that we became very close to, D.Y. In fact, he called Karen about 10 years later. He got a cell phone finally from his sister in the States. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, D.Y. calls her. She didn't know who the hell it was, so we finally figured it out. But at one point, he took us in the Mekong Delta to his uncle's house. And his uncle was a, a guerrilla leader, and it was fascinating to see this home. They heated. The, the, the fuel that they used was methane from the animals. They have these bladders, and the methane gas from the waste of the animal was in there, and that was used for cooking. And it was fascinating, you know, being, visiting this house. And after we visited, he took us another 10 miles down a dirty lane to a Ho Chi Minh memorial. And, you know, a little statue, and he said, you have to bow, and you have to sign the book here. He made a big deal about this Ho Chi Minh memorial. I said, what on earth? He can make us bike an extra 20 miles for this Ho Chi Minh Memorial. We were baffled. And later we realized he was not supposed to take us to the Mekong Delta. He wasn't supposed to take us to his uncle's house. He would tell anyone who questioned him that he was taking us to see the Ho Chi Minh Memorial and prove it. Of course, we had signed the book there. Another time I was with a small group and we were crossing from Cambodia, I think, to, uh, to Vietnam. And one of the women in the group, her visa was one day off. Her visa applied one day after we were there. They wouldn't let her cross. And they tried you know, giving gifts and everything else. She had to sleep in the jungle in a hammock for that night. They just wouldn't, uh, wouldn't permit the crossing. In Burma, uh, the guide mentioned his home village. And we said, oh, we'd love to see your home village. And again, he was horrified. Oh, no, we're not allowed to go there. It's not on the itinerary. We forget this. Everything seems so normal in some of these countries, but some of the communist countries have a very rigid uh, re you know, regime that, that you really don't identify with. I have down here the Solomon Islands. This wasn't really a bike trip. This was a diving trip. But the Solomon Islands were fascinating. It's one of those things where you learn about a people that no one even knows exists. <clears throat> we went to the Solomon Islands twice on diving trips. And the Solomon Islands, Islanders are the one place in the world where they don't want US dollars. It's of no use to them whatsoever. It's a world lit only by fire, and people have nothing. They're on these islands, they have no electricity, they fish and they grow crops, and they trade with diving tourists that come. And we were told when we come there, they trade for t-shirts and things like that. But we went twice, and when we went the second time, we knew what to bring. Fish hooks, batteries, that's what they really needed, because they have no other source of light at night. And I remember coming there and I traded the stuff that I had brought for a beautiful carved cane. I still had magnificent ebony cane. And as I'm walking back to the boat, I saw a guy with a little carving of some sort from a, a tusk of a pig or something. And I, I liked it. I had very little left to trade. I look in my, my bag there and I, I had one of these little things to give you on the plane with lip balm and, and soap and stuff you know, for on a plane. So I took it out and I said, I'll trade you this for, for that. And he says, what's in it? What's in it? What's in it? So I take it out and I said, oh, there's some soap and there's this. And then I took out, I think I got one here, this lip balm, little stick. Here it is. I said, oh, I said this. Oh, I said this. You take this, you put it on your lips like this. I said, All the girls in the village, they're going to want to kiss you. <laughs> oh, he want, oh, he would have traded anything for that. He calls over his friends, oh, tell them, tell them, I tell them. I said, so, you see, you put this on your lips, all the girls are going to want to kiss you, then they'll run into the bushes with you. Oh, they would, they would have traded anything to get that lip balm. I, got the, I still have the little carving. There's lots of fun. <laughs> on that same trip, there was a, uh, I was going to say something about, it. what was it, Nepal? Or? It was Nepal, where we're sleeping in tents. And I was with Mel. Mel is an operator. He's a, uh, an ambulance-chasing lawyer and a very smooth character. One example that will set up Mel, we were uh, in Guam. is after a diving trip. And in Guam, uh, we're waiting for a plane. We had three or four hours, so we went to a hotel where we didn't belong. But they allowed us to stay in the lobby, eat something. And we're sitting in the hotel lobby where it's cool and comfortable with all our luggage. And Mel says, come on, let's, let's look around the place. And we go outside, and we look around. And come down, there's a beautiful swimming pool, about 5 o'clock. And uh, he said, let's go for a swim. 
So where am I supposed to be? He said, no, they won't know. We'll go for a swim. Let's get some towels. So we go up to the window, and we say, can we have a couple of towels? And yes, sir. And they give us the towels. And we start walking back to the, where our bags are to put on a bathing suit. On the way back, we said, you know, these guys didn't know who we were down at the pool. But back in the lobby, they know we're not supposed to be here. Let's hide these towels in the bushes so, so they won't see us. So we go back to the room. We hide the towels in the bushes. We go back to the thing, open up our bag, take a bathing suit, go in the bathroom, put on the bathing suit, start walking back to the swimming pool. We get to where the towels are hidden. We go in the bushes. We pull them out. And just then, the guys from the uh, pool who gave out the towels come along, and they say, what's going on here? Mel is smooth. He just, these towels are filthy. Can you get us some new ones? <laughs> I mean, this guy was smooth. <laughs> we're in Bhutan, we were on a camping trip. We're sleeping in tents. Mel found a room every night. He would find, he'd find some temple or something else. He would sweet talk some women. He would just find a place every night. The downside of this was you had to drink the buttered, hot buttered uh, tea. They'd come into a temple and they'd give you this hot buttered tea, which think of it to this day, it's probably 20 years ago, it still turns my stomach. And as soon as you finish the damn thing, it fills up again. And you have to drink. It's as bad as the mayor's milk. God almighty, I hated that stuff. You better leave time for Christmas. Um, yeah, you know, I had just a, we biked in Estonia once. It was kind of flat country. It wasn't gorgeous. But one of the things that you can do when you're on a bike, we're biking along and we see a sign in Estonian, but the words were similar something Holocaust. Didn't know what it was, but it was a dirt path. We went down this dirt path, and a half mile or so down this dirt path, we see a, a memorial. And I guess it was in English and Estonian, and it turns out the end of World War II, there was a group of 1,200 Jewish uh, prisoners that were executed by the Nazis on that spot. Here it is in the middle of the woods. Nobody ever visited it. No one knew about it, and we found it just because we were riding on bicycles, and there it was. One of the things, and when you're on a place like <coughs> Bagan in, in uh, Burma or Angkor Wat, and the temples that go for miles in every direction, on a bicycle it's so easy to avoid the crowds and just go bicycling off and see all these sites on your own. I prefer to see a, a modest little temple by myself than the most magnificent Taj Mahal in the world with 100,000 other tourists pushing me around. Um, I have some notes down here of, uh, of the equipment that we use. We have bikes that uh, come apart and go into a legal size suitcase. Legal size being a suitcase that they won't charge you an extra $200 in each direction. Um, and this involves assembling the darn thing when in the hotel room. And as we found, the hotels in, uh, in Prague have white rugs. It's, it's, it's really rough. They have a greasy bike. My wife is down there rubbing with the magic, with the uh, wash and dries, trying to get the grease out of the thing. There's one hotel in Prague that won't let us back. but. Uh, uh, it is worth it because it's a tremendous saving. We tried to do a loop trip where we can leave the bike bags in the hotel and come back the next day. One of the joys of cycling in Europe is you can go from west to east with the prevailing winds and then take a train back. The trains, almost all uh, trains in Europe carry bicycles. It's a very easy way to travel. Um, we have 15 minutes. Let's ask questions. Any questions? Yeah. He was an upright God. He was good. He, would, he, was, he had a fascination with women. It didn't matter if they were young and beautiful, old and ugly. He would just, I don't know how he did it. Maybe they had a few words of English. But we slept in temples or homes almost every night, and everyone else was freezing in a tent. <laughs> he was smooth. I'm just that thing with the towels is brilliant. <laughs> Sorry. Where's your next place? Where are you headed You know, I, I didn't want to mention this right away, but. My real reason for doing all this traveling is to get 100,000 miles on United Airlines. If you have 100,000 miles, that's called 1K. 1K means you get a bed when you go on these long trips. So I fight like crazy to get 100,000 miles. And it's not so easy anymore because I have grandchildren that I prefer to spend time with. So I'm thinking of further and further away places. I'm thinking of New Zealand, perhaps, where we've been before, but it's a lovely and a big country. Yeah. We have, uh, most of the trips have been with smaller companies. The top of the line is Butterfield and Robinson. Very expensive, usually very short tours. It's six nights, five days of biking. It's uh, three to $6,000. Uh, 
Uh, the chores are top notch. We've been with them years ago. The chores are magnificent. They have titanium bikes, and they have a guide at the front and a guide at the back, but it's a very short trip and very expensive. Back Roads, again, a magnificent country, a company, and it's the same thing. I've been going with Spice Roads a great deal. Spice Roads, a uh, typical trip is uh, two to $3,000. Quite comfortable, nice hotels, air conditioned, swimming pools. Uh, guides are mostly good if they're not. Well, one trip we took in, uh, in Cambodia, I think I, I just picked this one up off the internet. The guide was an alcoholic, he was terrible. And myself and another fellow, we just took over the trip. The guide forgot the first aid kit. So I mean, I was bandaging people. He forgot his toolkit. Well, I was fixing bikes. In fact, a couple of nights, I remember we went into a hotel. It was filthy, so we went down the road for $10. We found a beautiful air-conditioned hotel, and we moved into that. Um, I guess I've been on enough trips. If the guide is terrible, I can manage it. Uh, in, in Kerala, we had a guide who didn't really know the routes. And as we'd ride along, we'd see a little road going up. We'd say, stop the you get out of the van, bike down, bike back, and you know, go on to the next thing. That was the guy that he took us to his, his family wedding, and we had to drink there. That was horrible. <laughs> and he, yeah. How big are the groups? Most typical groups are uh, six people, probably an average size. The one through Central Asia, they're really. Like three couples, three couples or uh, or three couples. Usually, if it's a third world country, I'm by myself. There's more guys than sometimes three couples. Sometimes two or three single guys and uh, two or three couples. And some of the people on some of the trips are very good cyclists. And some are horrifying. Uh, I'm always the oldest, except for one trip. <laughs> yeah? Do you ever use a GPS? Ah, you know, I went to MIT, but I'm computer illiterate to a certain degree. I do have GPS. Or I like a map, paper map and a compass. I'm so much happier with it. Uh, GPS would have helped me out on many occasions. I should really lean on my wife a little bit and, and do that from now on. Several times, <clears throat> I have a compass. One time, I remember hanging the compass around my neck. And I had a little knife I carried around my neck for cutting bread or cheese during uh, lunch. And uh, the compass just wasn't reading. I was like, God, it's, you know, it's supposed to be going north and it's showing south. Of course, the metal in the knife was was affecting it. Another time in Bali, in Indonesia, Bali. Bali's like this. It's a, it's a volcano which is erupting right now. You're either going up, which is north, or down, which is south. We're riding up this volcano one day, and I'm looking at my compass. It wasn't around my neck, and it's pointing south. I said, this is impossible. We're going north, and the compass is pointing south. Just then, some kids, uh, Australian kids, on a motorcycle came by. I stopped. I said, wait a minute. In the southern hemisphere, does a compass point to the south pole? Oh, they didn't really know this. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> what, what happened, the road was one of these things that went like this, and we didn't notice the road was turning. We were going indeed south. The compass does point to the North Pole all the time. <laughs> Anything else? Let me think. Oh, things to avoid on the trip. Anytime you go on a trip, there's some things to avoid. In Vietnam, you have to avoid the water puppet show. Every tourist gets sucked into the water puppet show. God almighty, is that bloody awful. It's a puppet show, but they have water in it. I mean, it's horrible. In Kerala, they have this dance or something. It's, uh, they paint their faces. Everything, the eyelids, everything's painted green. And the show consists of them sitting in this, uh, going, wiggling their faces around. There's no intermission at the show, because if there was, Everybody would sneak out. It's horrible. In Japan, you go to a Japanese opera. Again, it's all in Japanese. The guy's up there yelling away in a language you don't understand. Nothing's happening. They're just sort of screaming. And you're sitting there. Uh, very much, very much things to avoid. All the local shows. The other thing to avoid are the homestays. Almost every tour that you go to a, to a poor country, it's a homestay. You'll stay with this African village or you'll stay with this you know, family in Nepal or something. God almighty, what that means is it's, it's always a fake, almost always a fake. You go into someone's home, you're sharing a bathroom with 16 other people in the group, you're sleeping on a rat-infested mat of some sort. There was one homestay that was kind of fascinating. We went by elephant for about a two-hour ride up into the hills. The elephant was a board on the elephant's back. Very uncomfortable, especially after riding around bouncing on this elephant. 
crashing through the jungle on this elephant. Obviously, no other way up. You're going through this massive jungle. And after 10 or 15 minutes, I'm dying. I asked the guide who was with me. He had a little bag of food that we were bringing. I said, how much did this elephant cost? He said, it was $20. I said, I'll give you $20 to let me off. <laughs> but that was an authentic uh, homestay. The people were so poor, you could see we bought food and we made a meal for them with eggs and chicken and stuff. He said that they lived on rice and uh, some chili powder on it. And I could see this little girl there and we gave her some candy and stuff. And uh, you could see that they had not eaten like this in a long time. That was fairly authentic. However, the next day when it came time to go back, rather than ride the elephant, we walked through the jungle on a couple of miles and got back quite easily. Let me think if I missed anything else. Things to avoid. Homestays. Puppet shows. Oh, there was another, another homestay. It was a long house. It's always a long house. And again, a very uncomfortable. Shared toilets. And the show that night was uh, a woman playing a flute with her nose. She's blowing in her nose. This I mean, this really didn't need this. I, <laughs> What? Where was that? The homestay. Might have been Borneo. Borneo, I think. Uh, Borneo was a disappointment. It sounds very exotic. Borneo was quite modern. It's Malaysia. And the roads were quite lovely and modern. The drivers were polite. There wasn't a whole lot to see. It just the name Borneo sounded exciting. You can have some people come out of the jungle with you know bars in their noses and, and people. Oh, actually, on, in that trip, the uh, there were two two uh, groups. There were the cannibals and the pirates. And uh, our guide was a cannibal. Honest to God, his, they had to, uh, his grandfather had to eat somebody or kill somebody to become a man, to, you know, to get a wife. He was a cannibal, and the pirates had uh, guns, so the, the pirates pretty much took over from the cannibals. But that was the exciting part of Borneo. I forgot about that. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Have you spent much time in South America? South America, uh, not as much as I would like. I did bike in Bolivia. Bolivia was quite exciting. We biked up to 17,000 feet, and uh, that was cold. I thought it was sleeping in tents. I thought I was going to freeze to death that night. I put on every article of clothing I had in my sleeping bag, and the only thing that kept me alive, during the day I had bought a, a wool a, a, a rug from a woman, a native by the side of the road, and I put that over me, and that sort of made it worthwhile. Once in the Himalayas, in the Kashmir, I biked to 18,600 feet. It was the highest paved road in the world. And that was, you get up there, look at the snow, take a picture, and get out of there fast. 18,000 feet was high. Uh, in Kashmir, uh, when we biked in Kashmir, um, it was supposed to be from Leh to Maneli, but the airport was closed in Leh. So the guide asked, Would you guys like to fly to, uh, to Srinagar? Oh, sure, sounds great. Went to Srinagar. Probably at the time the most dangerous city in the world. We didn't know. We went there. Uh, there are houseboats, these beautiful wooden houseboats that the British used to stay on on the, on the lake or river. And we stayed at the houseboat, an enormous houseboat, probably as big as this library to myself. And the next day we biked up uh, to Leh. Meanwhile, my wife at home was reading the newspapers. Fifty pil pilgrims killed on a train. I mean, all along, it never entered our mind. Machine gun positions, artillery positions, it was a war zone. We had no idea. We were just biking along. And meanwhile, Karen at home is reading about the people that are being murdered along the way. One exciting thing about being to all these places, I keep running into, no matter who I run into, I've probably been there. I was uh, just at the, uh, at the gym when I was having my shoulder worked on at the place in, in Waltham. And a, a kid at the pool was just talking to me. It turns out he was Kashmiri. As soon as they found out, oh, yeah, I've been to Kashmir, and he started giving me swimming lessons. It was delightful. And, and this last trip to... Uh, uh, well, so was I just oh yeah to Thailand. I went. I needed some gifts for my uh, my daughter-in-laws, and there was one little shop. The last night, the only place I could possibly buy anything. There was a guy in it. Spoke perfect English. Turns out he's Kashmiri. No problem. We're buddies. Before I left, I was able to bargain with him and get some nice jewelry. <laughs> Any other questions? Anything? Oh. I I brought along a box of my books. And if anybody wants one, you can take it. I was going to say, if you want a book, make a contribution to the library of $5.
that would be nice, but I'll, I'll put them out on the table next to the cookies if anyone would like one. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> oh, I'll be damned. <laughs>